Right. So today we continue our discussion, or we start the, the formal discussion on digital filters. What we did last week before the midterm was just to give everyone a little refresher on this uh, transform and, and discrete time transfer functions. So today what we're going to do um, are to look formally you now at how we design um, digital filters to meet the, the sort of requirements that we might have. All right. So remember, even from when we were discussing the um, continuous time domain, that a transfer function, regardless of what, what it looks like, it has some frequency response. And remember in the, in the um, what do you call it, in the continuous time domain, if I were to give you a transfer function that, that looks something like, you know, H S equal um, two over S plus three, for instance, if I were to ask you what was the frequency response of it, you would you would recall that we were went to we made the substitution s equal to j omega, right into here, and we then evaluated h of j omega for various values of omega going all the way up from zero up to very high frequencies. So if I were to give you in in terms of the discrete time domain and ask you well what is the frequency uh, response of that. The approach would be, if you recall from last time, from Z, we now make Z the substitution from Z equal E to the J capital Omega. Remember, that's the re relationship between the DTFT and the, um, and the Z transform. So in the discrete domain, the, dis the description is in terms of Z, and the frequencies in terms of omega, capital omega. And in the continuous time domain, the description is in terms of S. And of course, the response is in terms of the continuous omega. So if I wanted to find out what the response of that transfer function is, then simply, this is what the DTFT is. And you remember, uh, when we were doing the revision, if you make the substitution Z equal E to the J omega, then this entire thing becomes now the Z transform, right? Recall if you haven't, re, um, what do you call it, reviewed what we did last week, now is as good a time as any to do it before we start to get in into um, any more um, details on it. So I have that. I make the substitution Z equal to E to the J capital Omega. And then once I do that now, I am in a position, so instead of here, what I do is to substitute Z equal E to the J omega. So I put that in here. Okay, so what I would have is, for instance, five plus two E to the minus J omega over one minus 0 0.8 E to the minus J capital omega. And I plot this now, I plot the magnitude, this would be, H J capital Omega is now this. And I will now plot the, the, the behavior of this as Omega varied. And if you remember, you remember Omega goes from zero to two pi, but it's similar, it, 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 it's periodic with period two pi. So it really goes up to zero to pi. And then from pi to two pi, it just is just the, 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 the mirror image of, of the, the first half. So you plot omega from zero to pi. Notice here, notice this point here is at right here, if you look at this capital omega. So this point here would be pi, 3.14, whatever it is. And you pick values. So it's discrete, so you could divide up the range into maybe 10. And you plot, you put zero, then 0 0.1 pi, 0 0.2 pi, 0 0.3, et cetera, all the way up and you plot it, and this is what the response, the frequency response would look like. You can, of course, connect this now that you have that. So this particular transfer function would have a response looking like that. If you want to get a more accurate idea, so wait a minute, before I do that, everybody's following that, right? Remember, we call from, from the, the what we did, discrete domain, continuous time domain. That's all right, yeah? Let me know, give me some feedback.
All right, good. So if you want a more, <clears throat> sorry, if you want a more um, accurate representation of what it looks like, then you can use a simulation tool like MATLAB. And MATLAB now has something called a filter designer toolbox. And when, when we meet on Wednesday, I'll, I'll pull that up for you so you'll have a, have, we, we can go through it a little bit in, in, in more detail. Notice the spelling here, right? Common filter, capital D designer. And if you plot it in, what you do is that you enter the coefficients for the numerator and the denominator, which would be minus eight in this case, remember, from what we did last week, Monday, they, these would be the A co these would be the B coefficients of B0 plus B1, Z minus one, etc. And down here, you would have A0 plus A1, Z minus one plus, and so on. So you enter the A's and the B's in MATLAB as a numerator and denominator coefficient, and you tell the filter, filter designer to run. And notice if you compare, again, it's going to run it from zero to pi. If you compare the, 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 the response of this with the previous slide, you'll notice that it, it is the same thing, right? Identical, except that they would have done several thousand and, and they, they, they connected their they points in there. The important things, of course, whenever you're doing that, look at here. The DC is at 35, right? Our DC here is 35. So you can kind of see that at least we're starting at the proper um, at, at, at the proper DC value and we're going down along the way, all right? And they have normalized it here, right? So what they do is that they divide pi by the number of samples. Okay, so this uh, instead of plotting pi, what they do is to divide pi by the number of samples that was used. I can't recall how many samples were used to, to, to evaluate this, all right? Okay, so the thing is, is we can design this now to create the particular response that we want. This is what we know doing. We know we know that once we get there, they, they, if, we, if we're given any transfer function, it's very easy now to figure out what the response of it is. You substitute S equal J, um, sorry, Z equal E to the J capital Omega, and you plot for various points of Omega. And of course, always remember this thing from before, we know that capital Omega is two pi F over Fs. Okay, so you can all you can convert from radians into hertz, but of course you need to know your sampling frequency, which was a point that we made all the time. Once you're in the discrete time domain, one thing that you always need to be aware of is what the sampling frequency is. All right. Right, so we want what we're going to do now in, in, in this section is to examine how we could design a filter to meet particular requirements. The real, and remember that the transfer function is a model, the, the real system operates on the difference equation. So whatever this, like your Laplace domain, when you were, when, whenever you were given HS, Right? When, when you were given HS, remember to figure out what the real world had to do, you have to eventually get to HT. And this tells you, for instance, the, the values of the components, caps, resistors, and, and so on that would be needed. In this case, if HZ is, is so on, the difference equation that would produce that is you take the inverse transform of that and we, and, and we saw the techniques to do that. And you can also have the input-output equation directly from that. You remember y hz is really yz over xz. This is the output, this is the input. So once you do that, the output sequence that you're going to get from this filter would be these values coming in, the input sequences coming in, and a delayed output. So every time, and you could work this out on a sample by sample basis. Yeah, that is all part of what we did um, back in signals and what we uh, reviewed last week as well. 
Right, so the difference equation again has a frequency response. This is in time. And this is, of course, is in the Z domain, the model. All right, so let's look at a, an example now and see how we can now use this sort of behavior to create what we actually want. So here I have a signal on top here, some samples of a signal. And somehow in saving the signal or in, in, in processing it, I have the data here, but notice what happens here. I have a spike in the, in, in the signal. So some noise or some sort of interruption has happened and the data, the original data that I have is now corrupted by this particular um, spike. How do I remove that? which is what filtering is about. So let's look at this particular um, expression inside of here. If I were to give you this, what is this doing? Let's have a look at this quickly and, and give me an idea. What exactly is this doing? <clears throat> Come on. Look at the equation carefully, right? Scaling the, okay, so we have inputs here, but look exactly what it's doing. So this is input one. This is my first input. This is second, and this is third. What exactly is it doing? It's not scaling it, but it's doing something fairly close to that, which is what? Just from an arithmetic point of view, what it is doing? It's taking one, adding it to two, adding it to three, and then dividing by three. If I take three values, add them up and divide by three, what am I doing? If I take three numbers, I add it up by three and divide by three. Okay. Take 27, 35, 42. If I add up those three numbers and then divide by three, which is a number of numbers, what am I doing? Or what have I just done? Average, exactly. Right, so this particular fil filter, what is it? Well, what it's doing is averaging. It's taking three values and finding the average of the three values. Right, this particular design is something therefore called a moving average filter. Notice what it's doing. N equal to one, if I start off here, there's the first value comes in. Of course, I have nothing here, nothing here because these are previous values, right? And then N equal to two. So it this now becomes the old value and then this is N equal to two. Then N equal to three. I finally have three. I average them. N equal to four. It will get rid of the old one and then put number four here, n equal to five, it will drop off the last one and have five, four, and three, n equal six, it will have six, four, and um, six, five, and four, and so on. So it keeps finding the average of three values, but it's moving all the time, right? So the average is always looking at the last three values. Um, the filter is looking at the average of always the last three values of the data. So let's apply it to the, the, the signal that we had before. If you look at it with the scale, this is the scale exaggerated. So notice what has happened. The filtered signal has reduced the spike by a certain amount. It hasn't eliminated it totally, but what we now have is a much improved version of the original one. Remember this spike was supposed to be a value somewhere around here, right? We haven't quite gotten there, but the filter has, has re reduced it from at least a value of, of three units, whatever that is, to about one and a half. There's a little bit of a adjustment around here as well. But by and large, what we've done is to get rid of the, the spike or to reduce the, 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 the effect of the spike on the data. Yeah? Everybody seeing that? 
Right. So somebody asked a question, would the moving average filter with more inputs lower the spike more? Yes, it would. The more in the and, and we're going to look at that um in, in a couple of seconds here. How many um average well, how many number um terms you want to average to get a particular behavior that you want? The more you average, the better it it it, it works. But look at something. If we go back to the equation quickly, notice here. As I said, just let me get rid of, of, of some of the um, data here, right? Okay, so value number one comes in. When we are now starting, so I have a value here. I have nothing here and nothing here. So the very first output of the filter is going to be a third of just the first value. The second value comes in Number two comes in here. This is now value one. This is still zero. So the second output of the filter is going to be the average of two. Right? Actually, not the average. So it's going to add up the two and divide it by three. So it's still not averaging. The first one was a third. The second one is now you add up two values and divide by three. Value three comes in now. And we finally have the full three sets of inputs here. So it's only after the third sample comes in that the moving average filter is going to behave properly, which is why if you look at the results here, notice that the first sets of values are different from what the real, this is what the real output is looking like. Luckily for us, the first value is zero. So a third of zero still gives us zero. The second value, it was adding zero and this looks like about 0.75. It divides it by three, so you have 0.25. The third is now one plus 0.75 plus zero and it's dividing it by three. So it's still under, under averaging if you like. And, and it's only after you start to get the full three values and the, 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 the system behaves. So if you were to do a, as, um, as Sydney was suggesting here, Yes, more, more values would work for you, but if you have um, 20 averages, it will take at least 20 samples to come in before the filter starts to work properly. So it's going to be a trade-off and we'll talk about that as we go along. Fair enough? Yes, Sydney, does that answer the question? Right, so, Let's see now, so we, we know that they, by averaging, we seem to have, um, uh, what do you call it, made an effect on, on, the, on the spike. We've reduced the effect. So let's look and see what the actual um, response of this filter would look like. That's the difference equation. The transfer function, you watch it and by straight inspection, right, it's a third. This one will be xz. So this is xz. This will be one delay, so this is Z minus one XZ. And this one is Z minus two XZ. Okay, so if I factorize it, right, it's X, XZ into one plus Z minus one plus Z minus two, right? Um, and then of course you have the, the one third there. And that leads us to this. So this is what a transfer function looks like. What is the frequency response of that? Well, you could substitute now Z equal E to the minus, sorry, E to the J capital omega and plot the values of omega from zero to pi. Right? So the spectrum will be that. I substitute for, for Z inside of here and you plot it or and you could prove this. There's another way to express this, and we want to keep it in this form. You'll see why in a, in, in a, in a little bit. This transfer function, I could express in this form. I'll leave you all to prove that for yourself, right? It's a little, it's, it's in one of the problem sets as well too. But just for your own um, experience with just manipulating the values, try to prove that the version that we have on the left-hand side and the version that we have on the right-hand side are the same. 
Why I'm, why we like the version on the right hand side, look a little bit here. You see the three here and the three here. Pretty soon we're going to see that there's a general form that will follow. So if it was a four here, the fourth order difference equation, the fourth order transfer function for the movement average would have had a four here. Okay? So we want to keep it in that form, but you proof, you can prove it very simply, at least at this stage, that the version on the left hand side and the one on the right are the same thing. If I were to plot the response, either pick you know, some values of omega from zero to pi or plot it using a tool like the filter designer, look at the response that we have. Notice it decreases and then there's a little lobe. And of course, at the Nyquist frequency, which if we're dealing with the radians here, this is at pi radians at that point. So notice again, it's symmetrical. So you could ignore everything beyond pi. We know that. But look at the response here. What kind of response is that? If I were to give you a, a, a filter and tell you, well, What's the sort of response, the main part of that? It's looking like what? What kind of filter? Low pass, band pass, high pass? What is it? Or none of the above? What would that be? LPF, HPF, right, band pass, right? For all intents and purposes, if you look at it, look at the main loop, it is passing frequencies in here. And then beyond here, well, there's a zero point here, then it passes some up to this point. So it for as a behavior, it's a sort of borderline low pass filter. We have a lobe here that we have to consider, right? So it's not an, an ideal um, low pass filter, but it's more low pass. It's not quite a band pass because it has both a low pass and some high pass values inside of here, all right? But if I were to pass something through it, it would behave like a fairly rudimentary low pass filter. All right. And where's the zero crossing? If I were to give you this transfer function, the zero crossings would be where the magnitude of H of omega is equal to zero. And that will only occur if this bit inside of here is equal to zero. If you set that to zero and you solve, you get that the zero crossing is at two thirds pi. Right, or two pi over three. So this point here, this point here is at two pi over three or two thirds pi, right? It is in fact a poor quality low pass filter. The ID low pass filter looks like that, right? So we have, it's doing some low pass work for us, but it has some, some is letting high frequencies go through at the same time. Some part of the high frequency is going, going, going through anyway. Right, so it's kind of like, you remember when we spoke about the window functions, there's a side lobe. So the main lobe, if you like the main lobe here, right, main lobe is a low pass filter, uh, so, so low pass filter because ideally what you want is to have a punch, uh, a, constant amplitude until the cutoff frequency and then it cuts off. But in this case, we have the, um, the, the main lobe is a low pass, sort of poor quality low pass filter, but we have some side lobes here, right? That, that, that let in some high frequencies that we, we, we don't want. So what happened then is that remember noise spikes, sudden changes in signals are in fact high frequency components. So when we pass the moving average filter through it, what it's doing is that the low pass filter from the 
uh, of the low pass filter uh, um, behavior is getting rid of those some of the high frequency components. So what we have left is a filtered signal, which is a little bit improved. Yeah, make sense? You all right with that? Right, so let's crank it up a little bit. Here we have, first off, this is what I was saying. If the, the general form, therefore, for the moving average filter, the general response for an nth order filter is one over n e to the minus e to the minus j n omega over one minus e to the minus j omega. So you could remember that. So at, for any order, so like a sixth order, which is what this example we're now showing here, this is one over six e to the minus, sorry, one minus e to the minus j six omega or six j omega, if you want to put it, over one minus e to the minus j capital omega, right? And if you want, you substitute the, the values of omega and look at what happens now. So the sixth order filter, right? Notice how many, how many lobes do we have? If you count it, six order has one, two, three, four, five, and we have the last one here, six. The previous one that we had n equal to three, we had, so let me get this right. We have one, two, three. All right? So if you look at it, so if I had, so the number of lobes in the response is proportional to the order of the filter. The other thing to note, so first off, everybody's seeing that, right? The second thing to note is where the Nyquist frequency is always at pi radians. If n is equal to an even number, then you have half of the you have half of the number of lobes then the Nyquist frequency and then the other half here. Remember, you could actually ignore this, right? You could ignore all of this on this side. But if I were to ask you to draw, for instance, what the response of an eighth order filter would look like, then draw the Nyquist frequency. If n is eight, it means you have to have four loops, right? So it's one, two, three, four, right? And the loops, of course, decreasing. Beyond Nyquist, you're going to have the other four. If n is an odd number, if n is an odd number, then the Nyquist frequency divide, you actually have the, 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 the lobe, you have to have an odd number. So let's say n is equal to five. You're going to have to have two and a half lobes before the Nyquist frequency. So put omega here. If n is five, you have one, you have two, and you have half the lobe here. That's two and a half. Then it's symmetrical around that. All right? Everybody seeing that? When n is even, Right, the number of lobes is equal to n. So when n is even, remember the Nyquist frequency is exactly at pi. So you'll have half, whatever n is, half before and half after. So if n is even, it's exactly uh, an e, uh, you see a complete number of lobes. If n is odd, you see a complete number, and then this is the last lobe, half of that lobe alone. Right, n is the order of the filter. Correct. Right, so what, what you have on the screen here is a sixth order filter. So N is the filter. Right, or the number of terms that are going to, for, for this particular filter, the number of terms that you averaging. So this, what I have here, 
a sixth order moving average filter means that it is averaging six terms to create its response. All right? Clear on that, Russell? Good. Right. Now, the other thing, the important thing is the zero crossing. This point here. The zero crossings are at, are, are at multiples of 2 pi over n, right? The first one is at 2 pi over n. The second one would be this by 2. The third one will be that by 3, and so on. So the, the, the zero crossings occur at multiples of 2 pi over n. We're not too concerned about these higher ones. We are concerned about this one because that this is the low pass filter part here. So if I know what this point is, I could design this filter to, to um, meet any frequency response that I want. And let's see how to do that. Right? Just a, um, a, a point, a lot of the, the applications for moving average filters have to do with removing noise from signals, right? They, they sort of high frequency noise, um, radio frequency noise, that kind of thing. So you have like the, what, what we have downstairs on the left-hand side is really a, a, like, like a pulse, a square pulse that has been corrupted by um, some sort of noise signal, right? A bad connection, bad, bad contact wires, that kind of thing. And if you pass it through, in this case, they pass it through an 11 point moving average filter and notice that you're now able to, to at least see the behavior of the filter and you could do something about it, All right? So that is the kind of the, the, the main application for, for moving average filters, All right? So question, how, how I want, if I am given an application or when I want to design a filter, then you need to do two, two things. First off, where is the first zero crossing going to be? Remember the zero crossings are two pi over n, right? That's the response here. That's the first, right? That this point here is given by two pi over n. And that basically gives us the sort of low pass behavior that we want. And always this. You cannot have any kind of digital design um, um, digital signal processing design or discrete signal processing design without a sampling frequency. Once you have to apply this to something, then somewhere along the, 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 the road, a sampling frequency has to be provided or you have to use the information to select one. So let's see. Here's a, 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 a design issue that you want to design an end term moving average filter, in other words, you have to calculate n, to be designed such that the first null or the first zero crossing occurs at four kilohertz. So what order of filter is needed for that? And then to sketch the response of the filter. And you're going to, you have to assume a sampling frequency. In this case, the question tells you to assume a sampling frequency of 12 kilohertz. So you're given the, the um, some thing here. So you have a blank scale here. I want the first null to occur at four kilohertz, four kilohertz. So the response of the filter is this. It's going to do something higher up. We don't know what it is. The sampling frequency is at 12, but I need to find out what order filter is going to give me a zero at this point in time, right? So you go, go to what, what, what you know, the zero crossings occur at omega equal to two pi over n. Notice I'm given the information in hertz, not radians. So I'm going to have to go to what we know. Remember omega is two pi f over fs. So two pi f over fs, if I equate the two of them, if omega is two pi, f over fs, and that is equal to two pi over n, right? The two pi is cancel, and you see clearly that n is equal to fs over 
F, right? I know Fs is 12 kilohertz, sorry, 12, um, yeah, 12 kilohertz, and F, which is a cutoff frequency, my zero crossing is four. So therefore, a third order moving average filter will satisfy me for this. And what would be the response if it's third order, the frequency response, if it's three, N is odd, right? The first kilohertz, this is my Nyquist here. My sampling frequencies are 12 kilohertz, right? So what do we expect the response? How many lobes is this thing, is this thing going to have? If n is equal to three, the response is going to have how many lobes? The complete response is going to have how many lobes? Three, exactly. So the response is going to look something like this. If the Nike, if I'm sampling at 12 kilohertz, then the Nyquist frequency is half of that, which is six kilohertz. So the response is going to have three, remember the, the lobe is basically going to do this. And this is going all the way up to 12 kilohertz, right? So lobe one, two, and three. This part of the response we do not use. The only valid answers are up until Nyquist, which is half of the sampling frequency here. So this is what the response of that filter would look like. It's a, just a third order, right? So the response would, would be fairly shallow. This is what a real, a high quality low pass filter would have given me. Okay, but this one is giving, um, it is working, but it's attenuating everybody, but at least it, it, it is doing the low pass filtering. The higher the frequency goes and the cutoff at four kilohertz. Yeah? Make sense? If I had used, if I had, um, the, the, no, the requirement is changing the, num, the, the order of the filter, right? I am given, right? In this case, I was asked to find out and given that I want my zero crossing to be that point and my um, sampling frequency to be 12 kilohertz. This is directly related. Remember, this is um, 2 pi over n is this point, right? So this determines the order of the filter. If I want to change the order of the filter, right, and still mean the same 4 kilohertz, then I have to change fs. Remember, n is fs over, over f. So if I want a bigger order, if I find a third order filter isn't giving me a sharp enough response and I want a fourth order, then this is fixed at four kilohertz. So my only solution is to send the sampling frequency up. If you have that ability, if whatever design it is, has that sort of ability. Yeah? Right. So. What would the transfer function of this filter look like? The difference equation is a third order, which is kind of where we started the whole, whole process, right? And if you compare this now with the general form of the transfer functions, remember the transfer functions have A's and B's, poles and zeros, you would see that they, they, this particular fil filter function only has zeros, all of the coefficients, and all of the coefficients are 0.3333, all right? It's a third of this. So if I were to expand that, it is 0.33xn plus 0.33 recurring xn minus one plus 0.333 recurring xn minus two. That is the, 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 the um, form of it. So the coefficients, the Bs are all 0.33 recurring. So if you were to draw the, the sort of um, the flow diagram that we had, this is what the block diagram, so we have the transfer function would look like. And all of these B 
B0s uh, would be 0 0.333, notice, notice that this particular type of filter is an, has, is an example of a finite impulse response filter. It has no feedback. There's nothing, there are no pass values of Y being considered. It just considers the inputs, um, the X inputs, the data coming in. It stores past inputs, but it does not store past outputs. And if you remember, we said that those kind of filters produce what is known as a finite impulse response. In other words, if I put, if Xn was delta N, an impulse, then Yn would give me a series of values and stop a finite number of values, right? So it's a finite response. So these types of filters, moving average filters, are an example of finite impulse response filters. Yeah? Make sense? Everybody following or followed? Everybody clear on that? Reasonably clear? It's a, fair, it's a very simple filter design. It's something that is very easy to even program um, to be to, 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 to in, in an actual application. So as your data comes in, right? Your programming thing, you don't have to, 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 um, to do anything fancy on it. As the data comes in, you take three, uh, a moving average, in this case of three, or whatever the, the, the order of the filter is, and just find the average and then send the data on. Okay, so that's all it's doing. It's like, if you recall a couple uh, weeks ago when we spoke about the, the short time Fourier transform, where you took the, the you had a window and you, you were sliding the window to, to, to select a, a set of data all the time. This, the moving average filter is the same sort of approach. It takes a group of data and averages that group as the data comes in. So it's a moving, it's always looking at the, at the, at the previous um, n values alone, the current and the last n minus one values and just taking the average of that, right? No more, no less, right? Hence the term again, moving average, all right? And the main application for these, because it's a, 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 a poor low pass filter, the main application for these um, types of filters are to process data that is corrupted by high frequency noise. And typically that high frequency noise is, is like um, um, uh, random noise interference, uh, thermal noise interference, those kinds of, of things that give you a lot of um, high frequency spikes, or maybe even uh, you, you're doing low frequency measurements, but somehow the, 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 the circuit is picking up radio frequency information around. This is the kind of filter, it's easy to design, to, to take their data and at least get rid of the first set of high frequency stuff from it. Yeah? Any questions? Yeah, no, maybe. All right. Okay, so. We started on this, so, so the next step up now will be to, to, to design some more complicated types of filters as we go along, and then to see exactly how you implement this thing. It's all well and good here. Right, this one is fairly easy because if you're doing this, as I said, all you have to do is to, as the data comes in, you just have to average it. But how do you actually go about doing that in, in practice? And we'll have a look at that as well as we, uh, as we do the design, all right? Okay, so if that's the, um, let me end the show here. All right, stop the sharing. So if there aren't any more questions, well, think about it. And on Wednesday morning, please God, we'll, we'll meet and, and go through any questions that you might have and go forward with the other parts, yeah? All right, so let me stop the recording.